Okay guys, I'm going to go ahead and get started. If this is too loud, let me know. We are now officially streaming to San Diego and Lancaster, so this is our first day doing it. Hopefully it all goes well. Um, I have a lot to get through, so I'm going, going to go ahead and get started. Um, so we are here today to talk about the disentitlement doctrine. It is the scariest thing you never knew existed. Um, so we are going to learn all about it during this lunch hour. Um, I want to give a disclaimer. This is a pretty nerdy MCLE. I'm aware of that. I guess this doesn't come up a lot. Um, but there is a lot of case law on this subject, and I think it is something that our clients could be subjected to more often than they are, so I think it is something that we should be aware about. Um, what did I do? All right, it's over. Um, the court ordered that the children not be taken out of the country. 
Dad, of course, then absconds with Mexico to the kids, he alienates them from their mom, talks all of this crap to the kids about how their mom's awful. Um, mom ended up bringing the matter before uh, the family court here in L.A. County. Dad totally knew about the proceedings. He was noticed. Um, he was really kind of playing games with the system. He appeared via an attorney, but his attorney only entered a special appearance. Um, the dad was in contact with the mom, with his attorney, but he refused to talk about custody. He refused to come back to the U.S. And the court ended up finding father in contempt. The court ordered dad to pay mom's attorney's fees and ordered the dad to pay for the costs that the mom had to pay to find him and the kids in the first place. So dad then appeals all of these orders. And the court of appeal completely dismissed his appeal. They wouldn't even hear it on the merits because they said that the dad was completely barred from seeking any appellate relief when he was still in defiance of the lower court's orders. So he was still in Mexico, still hadn't paid mom's attorney's fees, still didn't return the kids to her, um, didn't follow any of the court's trial court's orders. And so the Court of Appeal absolutely refused to hear his case, period. Um, and so application in dependency court, this is a really long quote, um, but it's a great quote because it really just packs so much information into a few sentences. Um, and this is from the case of In Re E. Abigail. So it says that appellate disentitlement is not just a jurisdictional doctrine, but a discretionary tool that may be applied when the balance of equitable concerns makes it a proper sanction. So basically that means it's not an automatic application. It's not going to be applied every time where it could be applied. It's discretionary. It's up to the courts. Second, you're balancing equitable concerns. Again, it's not an automatic application. Um, and then it talks about criminal cases often applied when the appellant is a fugitive from justice. So Roman Polanski scenario. Um, and then specifically in dependency cases, the doctrine has applied not has been applied only in the cases of the most egregious conduct by the appellant, which frustrates the purpose of dependency law. Um, it makes it impossible to protect the child or act in the child's best interest. So in dependency, specifically, it's only applied in cases of the most egregious conduct. I'm going to be saying that phrase a lot um, because it is very important. So when you're looking at the case bar, or when you're looking at one of your cases, one of the things you need to be asking yourself is, is this the most egregious conduct? And so we're going to kind of dive into the case law um, so that we can see what is egregious conduct and what's not. Um, and again, this is a balancing act. The court has to consider all of the factors. Not every time a parent is non-cooperative does that mean that they are going to be disentitled. Because let's be honest, that would mean like at some point in the cases, probably all of our clients would be disentitled because at some point, you know, the parents become non-cooperative. But again, this is reserved for only the most egregious cases. Um, and just kind of as a side note, I'm not going to go into this in huge detail, but there is actually codified disentitlement in California, um, specifically for denial of FR. If a parent absconds with the child, they can be denied family unification services because of that. Um, same with the California rules of discovery. If someone fails to comply with the rules of discovery, um, they can be barred from admitting that evidence um, at the trial. So that's there. It's interesting. You guys can look at it. I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail about it. Um, another example of qualified disentitlement is in the Family Law Code, which specifically says that if a person refuses to submit to a DNA test, then the court can resolve the issue of paternity against that person. Um, so again, just another example of codified disentitlement. Um, so getting into what type of conduct by a parent is considered egregious enough. When are we going to apply, potentially, disentitlement? Um, so we look to the case of adoption of Jacob C. Um, this is a case, I believe it was out of LA County. Um, mom and dad were married, they had two kids, then they had very contentious divorce. Dad married stepmom, dad got custody of the two kids, mom absconds with the daughter, leaves the son, Jacob, with the dad and the stepmom. Um, five years go by. Then stepmom decides to file to terminate parental rights of mom so that she can adopt both the kids. Both Jacob, who's been living with her for the past 
past five years, as well as the daughter who's been gone with mom for the uh, past five years. So mom was noticed at the hearing, and the court knew that she knew about the hearing, because she hired an attorney, the attorney made a general appearance, but mom refused to come to court. She refused to come to court, she refused to bring her daughter to court. And so the trial court said, okay, until you come to court, I'm not going to let you participate in these termination of parental rights proceedings. And I'm not going to let you contest the adoption. If you want to contest the adoption, you come here, you bring the kid. Um, so mom refused to come to court, and a non-contested adoption hearing was held. Mom's attorney was excluded from the hearing, um, and the court ended up TPRing. So this is in a private adoption. This is not in a depend dependency court context, but the facts are kind of similar and I think something that we can understand and something that we can kind of wrap our minds around. So what the court did here was apply disentitlement doctrine to the mother by completely barring her from being able to participate in these proceedings because she refused to come to court. So mom appeals. And she argued that the trial court didn't last, let her contest the TPR and didn't let her participate in the hearing. The appellate court said, sorry, trial court's actions were totally appropriately appropriate. They noticed you to come to court. They told you what you should have been doing. Come to court, bring the kid. You refused to do it. So by your own actions, you're the one that decided not to participate in this hearing by refusing to come to court. Um, so again, she received notice, she received the opportunity to be heard, and mom chose not to exercise that. So this is kind of another example of classic disentitlement. Um, as a side note, the court did end up reversing the TPR in this case, but only because the court neglected to appoint the kids an attorney. So mom kind of got another shot at it because it got reversed, and she at that point could decide, all right, I'm going to come to court and participate, or not. Um, so it was kind of interesting because the appellate court said that, no, totally appropriate to just bar mom from these proceedings. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, so moving on to the dependency context and talking about what is egregious enough conduct. Um, the case of In Re CC, probably some of you know it. Um, the court authorized a 730 psychological evaluation for mom for the purposes of determining whether or not to deny her services under 361.5b2. Um, that she would, has a mental, you know, inability to be able to benefit from family unification services. Mom refused to participate in the 730 eval. Minors counsel at the contested disposition argued that the court should deny mom FR because she shouldn't be allowed to benefit from her refusal to cooperate with the 730 evaluations. The court said, I don't think I have a legal basis to deny her FR, so I want to deny her FR, but I have to give it to her. Um, minors counsel then appealed to the court's granting of family unification services to mom. Um, the appellate court held that although up until this point, 2003, um, all of the decisions in regards to disentitlement doctrine generally applied to the abduction of children and then filing an appeal, the principle articulated in those cases, um, that principle being that the parent's conduct frustrates the ability of another party to obtain information it needs to protect its own legal rights, um, extends to other circumstances as well. And so we then have um, the court holding that when a parent is non-cooperative, the trial court has the inherent power under disentitlement to bar that parent from seeking further assistance at the court, including family reunification. Um, so the appellate court also kind of goes off on this tangent about how it's especially appropriate in the context of FR because FR is not a constitutional entitlement. Um, so therefore, it's particularly appropriate. Um, I was prepping this during like the last few episodes of Game of Thrones. There's a lot of Game of Thrones gifts. Um, so mom tried to argue on appeal that in order to have disentitlement apply, you have to show mens rea. Um, AKA that the mother was intending to do these acts and intended this result. The court held that all that's required to imply disentitlement is a willful act. So willful, willful act, um, I believe the court pulled this from the penal code, 
um, is an act that's performed with the purpose or willingness to commit the act, not that the actor intended to violate the law. So, you did this act, Mom? That's enough. We don't care what your intent was. It doesn't matter. Um, Mom also tried to argue to the court that the court could have found her in contempt of the order to go participate in the 730 evaluations, but the court declined to do that. Appellate court says, no, nice try. A finding of contempt is not required for disentitlement to apply. Um, so then kind of on the flip side, if these are examples of conduct that is egregious enough to have disentitlement apply to the client, what are examples of conduct that is not egregious enough? This is another, um, another dependency case, Catherine S. So in this case, the court sustained a petition. The child was ordered home and parent mother. Mother absconded with the child. Three years go by. Mom's attorney is relieved. Um, the court then, after mom's attorney is relieved, I have no idea why they did this, then orders FR, terminates FR, sets a 2-6. All while the child is missing, all without mom having an attorney, which, yes, I know all of you are like, what? Exactly, the court's not supposed to do that, but they did. Um, so obviously when the 2-6 was set, mom didn't get notice. Um, she didn't file her notice of intent to file a right. So when mom returned to California, she then gets a new attorney to represent her, and that attorney immediately filed a notice of intent, um, followed by the writ. And the appellate court held that the trial court, obviously, as we all know, improperly proceeded when the mother was unrepresented and when the child was still AWOL. Um, the court in this case, I, I really don't know why, the court was super sympathetic to this mom. They were like, yeah, she absconded, but she's already been punished criminally for absconding, and she only did it to protect her family. Um, she wasn't trying to thwart the court. So for whatever reason, Catherine asked, this court was super sympathetic to this client. I think a lot of it probably had to do with the fact that the trial court really messed up and continued in the case and held all these hearings when they shouldn't have and when mom was unrepresented. Um, so Catherine asks, the court specifically held, when a parent absconds with a child at any point in the proceedings, the court has no choice but to issue warrants and wait for their return. They can't do anything else. They can't proceed. Um, but at this point, the court said she's back. She already dealt with it on the criminal side of things. We aren't going to imply disentitlement to her. Um, so I really hope my technology cooperates with me. We are going to take a break. I see eyes glazing over, so let's play a game. Any of you who came to one of my previous trainings, you're probably familiar with Kahoot. So if you guys want to form teams of five, no more than five, um, break up into teams of five, pick a team name. We're going to hop over to Internet Explorer um, so that you guys can um, enter in the pin. When you enter in the pin, you'll join the game. You'll type in your team name when everyone's in. We will start playing the game. So I'm going to be I'm giving you guys kind of hypos. And so the hypos, all you have to do is answer the question. Does this entitlement apply? Yes or no? That's it. Um, so if you answer correctly, you get points. If you answer correctly and quickly, you get more points. And whoever wins gets a prize. So let me hop over to the Kahoot website and form your teams of five. And San Diego and my pastor can also form your own team. So escape on the escape on the keyboard. <laughs> Only one more. Yeah. Okay. So this pin up here, the so five six eight eight three seven, is what you need to enter in your teams. And then it will bring up the game and just wait. So when everyone uh, joins, we can start playing. <laughs> just one person per group needs to be on the phone. So one group, one phone. <laughs> I'll shake my head over here. Wait, we 
Um, although the kids were released to mom, she absconded with them after the detention, before the adjudication. Over the next two and a half years, the court held periodic review hearings to see if they could find the kids. Eventually, they found the kids in Mexico. Mom and the children didn't attend the adjudication hearing, but they were represented by counsel. The court sustained sex abuse allegations against dad, and mom was found to be a failure to protect. Court ordered family maintenance for mom, and mom appealed. What do you guys think? Does disentitlement apply or not? Somebody is hacking our phone. I say I'm getting it too fast, so like I don't understand. You got. You have to wait for the screen to pop up before you answer. <coughs> Otherwise, it boots you out. So you have to wait for the screen to pop up. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Oh. Wow. Oh, all right. Fifty-fifty. Well, guys, guess what? This was four hundred four Zeidler's court, and as you know, Zeidler is always right. So yes, disentitlement applied. Um, the appellate court said that Catherine S. told us to hold periodic review hearings. That's what the court did. Mom totally frustrated the dependency court process here. She took the kids away. Um, and in fact, I think she there was a question as to whether or not she was letting the dad have contact with them in Mexico. So the appellate court said yes, mom was completely frustrating the dependency court process. <coughs> Hey. All right, it'll be put Jackie in the lead. Although, DLS won, you guys are only like two points behind, so neck and neck. Um, so, moving on to round four. Father wanted custody at disposition. Social worker made at least seven attempts to reach out to him to evaluate his home. Dad didn't respond to the social worker. Sounds a lot like probably many of our clients. Um, court ordered the child to be placed. Dad appeals and DCFS says disentitlement applies. He didn't cooperate with us. So, is the department right? Wait until it pops up before you answer. Oh, you guys are fast. Um, okay. So, yes, majority rules. And the answer is no. Disentitlement doesn't apply. This was an unpublished case out of San Diego County. The appellate court said that this behavior was not egregious enough. This doesn't frustrate the purpose of dependency court. It frustrates dad's ability to get what he wants, which is placement of the kid, but it doesn't frustrate the purpose of the court. So the appellate court said, no, this entitlement doesn't apply. Um, all right, scoreboard is not moving too much. Middle three plus Jackie. Um, so moving on to round five. Mom was barred from presenting evidence at the 12-month review hearing at the trial court level because of her conduct in the past six months. She was allowed to cross the social worker in a limited capacity. Mom, in the prior six months, had hid the child from DCFS in the court in another state, repeatedly lied about the child's whereabouts and well-being, provided the child math and other drugs, denied the child access to psychiatric care and support services. 12-month review hearing was held after the child was located, so we're complying with Catherine S. Um, the issue goes up on appeal, and the issue uh, before the appellate court was, did the trial court appropriately apply disentitlement doctrine to the mother at the trial court level? So again, wait until it pops up on the screen before you answer. Yeah. All right, so yes, majority rules again. The appellate court said yes, this was proper. And I, I read dozens and dozens of disentitlement cases in preparing for this training, and this one honestly is probably the scariest to me. Yeah. Because this trial court said, Mom, you were a total jerk. Um, we are going to let you contest the 12-month review period. And the appellate court said that that was completely OK, which is just bananas to me. Um, so this case was a little unique in that when they were setting the 12-month hearing, Miner's counsel gave notice that he was going to be relying on disentitlement doctrine. Um, to prevent mom from contesting the 12-month review hearing. So you think we have like bad activist minors counsel here in LA? This guy was just like totally psycho. 
um, and really going after mom. So he gave notice to mom and mom's counsel that he was going to ask to disentitle her from the 12-month proceedings. At the 12-month review hearing, minor's counsel then asked to call witnesses and have an evidentiary hearing on the issue of whether or not mom thwarted the purpose of dependency court. So then minor's counsel puts on this whole contest, he calls multiple social workers, the mom, he calls the mom, the mom testified about what she was or was not doing in the six months prior um, to the review hearing. And then the court at that point, after its evidentiary hearing on the issue of disentitlement, found that yes, mom was in violation of the court orders, disentitlement doctrine applied. So she was kind of able to defend herself a little bit in that she had an evidentiary hearing on whether or not she was in disentitled. But then once that happened, they proceeded with a 12-month review hearing. County counsel entered their reports into evidence. Mom objected, said that she wanted to call the social worker to testify. Um, <coughs> county counsel was able to, to call the social worker on direct. Mom wanted to ask questions on cross. And the court said, no, you aren't allowed to participate in this hearing. You're disentitled. Um, so it was kind of a unique situation. Um, and it was a minor's counsel that brought it up. But again, it's really terrifying. This mom was completely cut out of the 12-month review hearing um, because of her actions in the prior six months. And the appellate court said, yep, that checks out. Totally OK. Trick question. Huh? Trick question, right? <laughs> All right. So where are we? Up, oh, San Diego in the lead. <laughs> San Diego, I don't know if you heard that, but everyone in this room was just like, oh. <laughs> All right. So moving on, where are we? We're on six, right? Yes. OK, so moving on to round six. So at the detention hearing, dad left without notifying his attorney in advance. He claimed to have Indian ancestry, but he wouldn't provide the department with the necessary information. Um, father had previously told the social workers that he would not cooperate, he wouldn't do anything they asked, he refused to comply with court-ordered drug testing, he refused to show up to the adjudication or the disposition. All throughout this time, he was represented by an attorney. The court sustained the drug count, ordered suitable placement and FR for the dad. Dad then appealed, and during this process, he also had pending charges for meth possession. So DCFS argues disentitlement applies. So does disentitlement apply or not to his appeal? Oh. All right. <laughs> So, this is another scary case, you guys. The answer is yes. The court said, um, the appellate court said that it can dismiss an appeal where there has been willful disobedience or obstructive tactics, and that on this record, father has been uncooperative and a total jerk from the beginning. To me, reading this fact pattern, again, it's kind of scary because it's like, okay, well, this is like, you know, an average Monday, whatever. Yes. Um, so it's really scary because the appellate court said, yes, disentitled. This is the case of In Re AK, it's 2016, and it is published. So this is law that is citable and it is actually really bad for us. Um, the appellate court just really hated this dad. They said that his behavior demonstrated an extraordinary and unmitigated pattern of obstruction. His refusal to drug test and participate in the dependency case plan, his hostile behavior toward the social workers, all shows a pervasive indifference to the child's safety and to the amelioration of the conditions giving rise to dependency. Um, so I guess for the appellate court, this is like, you know, horrible, egregious conduct. Maybe not for us, based on what we see, but the appellate court completely dismissed his appeal under disentitlement. Um, all right, let's check our leaderboard. DLS won. Oh, boy. All right. I guess I'm going to be mailing you guys your prize if you guys win. Um, so let's move on. We have two more rounds. Uh, round seven. 
So Dad had the child in his care, but he wouldn't allow DCFS to evaluate his home. He didn't enroll the child in counseling, and he did not get medical insurance for the child. Dad didn't enroll in the classes for the referrals that the social worker gave him, and he didn't show up to the jurisdiction hearing. He was ordered to show up by the court, and he didn't. At Dispo, the court found father to be non-offending, previously non-custodial, but then removed the child from him because he was non-cooperative um, and found that placement with him would be detrimental under 361.2. Um, father then appealed. DCFS argues that disentitlement applies, so as usual, the question is, is DCFS right? And then wait for him to talk about this. <laughs> Alright, we're split. Um, the jury rules on this one again. The answer is no. This is an unpublished case where the court said this isn't egregious enough. Um, it's kind of similar to, I believe, problem two, where, yeah, dad's kind of frustrating his own ability to get the child placed in his care. Um, and his actions brought into question whether or not the child could be placed with the father safely, but it didn't frustrate the purpose of dependency court to the extent that it should prevent him from being able to appeal. Um, basically, the appellate court in these types of cases is saying, hey, if you want to screw yourself over and make you or yourself not a placement for the kid, that's on you. Um, we aren't going to disentitle you for it. All right, San Diego's still in the lead. Um, we have one more round. This one is probably our longest fact pattern out of Lancaster, for those who are interested. Um, so round eight, mom had an open court case for siblings. Classic fact pattern, right? She has a new baby. Social worker's like, hey, you aren't pregnant anymore. Um, did you have that baby? And mom's like, well, I'm not telling you. I didn't have that baby. I don't know. Um, social worker then asked her on another occasion, and mom's like, no, I'm totally still pregnant. Didn't have that baby. Um, social worker then goes to mom's house to investigate. Maternal aunt refuses to let her in. Of course, later we find out that, yes, mom had had the baby. Um, and mom claims that she immediately gave the newborn to the dad, and she has no idea where the dad is or how to reach him. So social worker at this point gets a warrant, notifies mom of the detention hearing. Mom refuses to go. She then refuses to go to the continued detention hearing. She eventually comes into court in custody because a warrant had been put out um, for her arrest and a protective custody warrant for the child. Contempt proceedings were held, um, but the court ultimately didn't find her in contempt of the court. The court decided, you know what, she's given all of the information she has. I really don't think she knows how to find this dad. Um, the court adjudicates the petition, denies her family unification services, sets the two six, all while the baby was still missing. Mom then appeals. So, what do you guys think? Does disentitlement doctrine apply here or not? <laughs> So, the kid has to be like, All right! <laughs> you guys are wrong. Just kidding. You guys are right. Of course you're right. Um, so, this is from In Ray Baby Boy M. Like I said, it's a case out of Lancaster from 2006. Um, the appellate court said, yeah, this mom's difficult, but all of her, quote, obstructive conduct happened before the filing of the petition. So everything in that first kind of bullet point, all pre-petition filing. She was being a jerk before the petition was filed. Totally fine, according to the appellate court. Um, and then she lied to the social worker about having given birth, but the court said that this isn't enough. The court reversed and remanded everything. And obviously, as we know, the court shouldn't have proceeded while the child was missing. All right, so San Diego, number one. So I will mail you out your Starbucks gift cards. Congratulations. Uh, how do I get back? This one? So hopefully now that people are a little bit more awake, we'll go back to our presentation.
in every single Okay, so as you guys have probably noticed, disentitlement doctrine in the context of dependency is not just an appellate doctrine. Um, it can be used against your client at the trial court level, um, and the court has specifically held in re EM that disentitlement is a doctrine that can apply in the trial courts. Um, so, like we talked about in re CC, not complying with the 730 eval. Um, we saw the unpublished case where mom was totally um, cut out of the 12 month review hearing because of her actions. So this absolutely is both an appellate doctrine where the appeal can be dismissed and not even considered by the court. Um, and it can also be applied at the trial court level. So something to keep in mind. Um, so what does all of this mean? You know, what are some of the examples of when this can be used against your clients? Um, obviously, if a parent absconds with a child and then appeals, their appeal is likely to be dismissed under the disentitlement doctrine. Um, likewise, if they appeal and then abscond, it's probably going to apply. Just don't appeal and abscond in any order. It doesn't, doesn't work. Don't do it. Um, if a parent refuses to comply with a 730 evaluation, in addition to the family law quote that I cited earlier, there's also unpublished case law that says that when a parent doesn't go to a court order DNA test, that can then be used against them. So that's another example of where disentitlement doctrine can be used against our clients here at the trial court level. Um, there is also an unpublished case that says that it's appropriate to um, strike testimony at the trial court level. So in this case, mom had shown up, I think it was just a drug count, that was the only allegation. Mom showed up, she testified. And then she just like ran away in the middle of her testimony. The, the case was continued to another day, and mom never showed up again. And the court was like, okay, well, you didn't finish testifying. No one could cross-examine you, so all of that's stricken from the record. Um, and that wasn't the issue on the appeal, but the court of appeal said that that application by the trial court was proper. Um, so our client shouldn't be running away in the middle of their testimony. Um, possibly, I was thinking, what about if a parent doesn't update their address in the JV 140? They're told they need to keep it updated, they move, they don't update it. You know, are they then disentitled from objecting to notice if they move to a different address and don't update it with the court? Something to think about. Um, it also can be used to prevent a parent from putting forward a defense at a review hearing. That's the case that we talked about um, in the Kahoot game. And it also came up in the adoption of Jacob S. because that was a contested private adoption and the court didn't let the mom participate in that. And that's a published case. Um, it also can be brought up in regards to the parent's refusal to drug test, participate with DCFS, participate in services. That's the case that we talked about in the game where it was allegedly super egregious conduct that frustrated the purpose of dependency court. Um, and then just kind of as, as something to think about, you know, what about if you have this county council that tries to bring in your client's failures to comply with other court's orders as a means to disentitle them here in children's court? So have you guys had those county council who are like, well, they didn't comply with their criminal court, so they shouldn't be able to blah, blah, blah here. Um, you know, I think we could argue that that is a separate court, a separate process that shouldn't be held against them here. Um, but something to think about. So how can we use it is kind of something that I grappled with in reviewing the cases. Um, there are a ton of unpublished cases in terms of parents' counsel at the appellate level trying to apply disentitlement doctrine against DCFS in the appeal, um, kind of in the context of when DCFS failed to do something that they were supposed to do. Um, thus far, courts have declined to apply disentitlement doctrine to DCFS, and they specifically say that they aren't addressing the issue of whether it can apply to DCFS, it just doesn't apply to DCFS in this particular case. Um, so it's just kind of something to think about in terms of how could you potentially use this in your cases and kind of against county council or against DCFS. So things like the rules of discovery um, that we talked about earlier, turning in late reports if an ROR was ordered and they didn't get the report in, you know, can we argue that they are essentially disentitled from admitting that into evidence? I'm not saying yes or no, these are just kind of 
things to think about. Um, another one that come, came up frequently in the case law was a failure to arrange visitation. Um, and also just kind of something that I was thinking about in prepping for this presentation. You know, what about if we turn in documents at a 218, we ask that the social worker verify them and attach them in an LMI, and the worker doesn't do that. Can we then argue that county council can object to those documents coming in because they had the opportunity to verify them and didn't? Um, just kind of things to think about. I'm not at all saying that we should go in and be like, on every case, disentitlement applies, you can't do that county council. Um, but I think in the right case, and if you set it up correctly, this is potentially something that we could use to our advantage with the right set of facts in the right case. Um, and obviously talking to your, your firm director or your supervisor about it. Um, so in the case law, there were two specific cases where the parents had appealed a termination of parental rights claiming that DCFS was disentitled from this permanent plan um, because they failed to arrange sibling visits. So it was weird. They didn't argue that they failed to um, arrange visits with the parent. It was both of these cases were focused on sibling visits. Um, in both cases, the appellate court said that the parents did not raise disentitlement at the trial court level, um, so they are waived from bringing it up at the appellate level. So if this is something that we want to look into, you have to raise it at the trial court level. For us, against DCFS, the court said, no, they need notice, you, you waived it, but not bring it up. Um, furthermore, in both of these cases, the appellate court said that um, there is nothing to show that the sibling visits were actually ordered. They just said, you know, please set up these visits if you can, DCFS. There was no order to set up the sibling visits, so DCFS wasn't violating any order by the court. Um, and in one of the cases, in Ray AM, DCFS did set up sibling visits anyway, so I'm not sure what this parent's appellate counsel was thinking. Um, they got very creative, I appreciate that. Um, but the appellate court was like, nope, nice try, not gonna happen. Um, so kind of the lesson from these two cases is, if we're going to be raising this issue, it needs to actually be an order. Um, it can't just be, please set this up if possible. It has to be an order from the court. And we have to raise the disentitlement doctrine at the trial court level. Um, so there, there's another case um, published, this, no, sorry, this one's unpublished, um, regarding uh, parents appealing a TPR. And the parents try and bar DCFS from participating in their appeal at all under the disentitlement doctrine because they fail to investigate relative placement. Um, the appellate court said, again, they waived this issue because they didn't raise it at the trial court level, and DCFS was not in an attitude of contempt of the court. Um, the appellate court said that DCFS looked into three different relative placements. The reports weren't the greatest that they got back and gave to the court. They lacked specificity, but they were kind of trying to comply with the court order. And this is reserved, again, for the most egregious um, examples of violations of court order. So the court said, no, that's not enough. Um, and then another unpublished case, Jeremiah M. Again, this is mom and grandma appealing from the grandma's denial of a relative placement hearing. Um, grandma asked, again, to completely cut out SSA, I don't know what that is, you know, DCFS equivalent, um, from participating in the appeal under disentitlement doctrine because they failed to prepare reliable reports as required under the statute. The appellate court says, yeah, we're disappointed in, in DCFS. Oh, this was cut and paste. These reports sucked. The social worker didn't remember where she got the information um, in the reports from. But we aren't going to apply disentitlement here because the purpose of this review is not to punish DCFS, but to ensure that the child's best interests are protected. And in this case, it wasn't in the child's best interest to be moved to this relative placement. And so the court specifically found that based on the record, um, a change in placement would not have been best for the child. So they said, no, we aren't going to apply it. Or we aren't going to apply it. So just kind of things to think about in terms of potentially using disentitlement against DCFS or against the county. Um, I think it's really important to pick the right case and do the legwork. Make sure it's a court order. Walk the matter on if DCFS isn't complying with order. You know, potentially a motion for sanctions. Um, we have to raise disentitlement at the trial court level. And, uh, you know, especially in context 
of visitation, of parents not getting their court ordered visitation, and not getting visitation then prevents them from um, exploring a possible C1B1 exception to TPR in our whole kind of Hunter S scenario. Um, this is kind of where I would imagine is a, is a place where we could potentially pursue this. Um, but these are just kind of ideas and things to think about. And it is brought up in the case law, at least the unpublished case law, in terms of parents trying to use it against DCFS, but thus far being unsuccessful for a variety of reasons. Um, so then, finally, just kind of to finish up some of the case law. So there's a lot of creative attempts at disentitlement doctrine in the case law. Um, in one case, mom tried to argue that dad was barred from appealing a restraining order because he kept failing to follow the restraining order. So he appealed it saying, court shouldn't have granted this restraining order, um, you know, the evidence wasn't sufficient, and meanwhile, while the appeal was pending, dad kept violating the restraining order. Sounds like a great case to apply disentitlement. Like, he's violating the restraining order, he's appealing the restraining order, no, dismiss his appeal. Um, but the appellate court said that the trial court made a change to the restraining order. Um, at the hearing on the permanent restraining order and failed to notice dad of that. So dad didn't have notice of this change, therefore disentitlement couldn't apply. Um, there is another unpublished case in regards to the 730 evaluations. This is Christine J. Um, in this case, the trial court ordered family reunification services, simultaneously ordered two 730 evaluators to see if dad had the capacity to utilize FR services. So it was kind of weird because it's like we're giving him FR, but we're also evaluating to see if he can utilize FR or not. Um, dad didn't cooperate with the 730 evals. DCFS then filed a 388 to terminate his family reunification services under disentitlement doctrine. Um, and the trial court agreed and said, yeah, we're terminating your family notification services, you are cooperating with these 730 evals. Um, dad appeals, the court reversed the termination of family, or excuse me, reversed the termination of family notification services and found that disentitlement doctrine doesn't apply. This case was kind of weird and I think it hinged on the fact that the court made a weird disposition order. It kind of wanted it both ways. It's like you're getting FR but you're also getting evaluated to see if you can benefit from it or not. Um, and the court in this case really just like totally trash talked in CC, which is the case that says yes, a parent can be disentitled if they refuse to comply with a sub evaluator. Um, CC is published so that's the one that we are stuck with. Um, and Christine Jay was out of a different district than in Ray CC, so I think maybe that had part of, um, maybe that was part of it. But the trial court in this case, because of its weird disparate order of disentitlement, couldn't, didn't apply. Um, so, a kind of disentitlement doctrine as a sword. Um, this case is in Ray Molly T. It was at one point published, it has since been depublished, so it's not citable anymore. This was a really weird case. Um, the mom appealed the court's decision to give her FR um, <laughs> when she was missing. Mom said that she was whereabouts unknown and she should have been denied FR. Please what? deny me FR. Um, so on appeal, DCFS argued that mom's conduct falls within the disentitlement doctrine and the appellate court agreed. The appellate court said that mom abandoned her child at the hospital, failed to appear at any of the dependency court hearings, therefore mom frustrated the entire dependency process by engaging in, you know, quote unquote, obstructive tactics. Um, and she effectively abandoned her child. So, it's really weird. Mom never shows up. She has an attorney. She then appeals the granting of family unification services and the appellate court essentially said that mom was trying to twist this around and use it to her advantage that she was going to you know wait to show up show up get six more months of fr and kind of drag um things out so they said this is not um what the statute was intended for mom's engaging in these obstructive tactics she can't use disentitlement as a sword in this manner so the court said um that yes, she should have been denied FR and they are not going to uh, grant her FR. Or excuse me, the reverse. 
And so again, this was Molly T, and this case has been depublished. At one point, it was published. Um, so why does all of this matter? We've talked about a ton of cases. Like day to day, what does this mean for us? So if you have a client whose appeal is pending and they aren't following court orders or giving DCFS or the court an exceptionally hard time, warn them that this could potentially impact their appeal. The appellate court could say, we are dismissing your appeal because of the conduct um, that you were engaging in. So I think that we should be advising our clients of that. Um, we also need to be advising our clients that if they show up for testimony one day, they better show up for that testimony the next day, otherwise their testimony will be completely stricken and it's like they never testified in the first place. Um, again, because of the case law, I think we should be advising our clients that if they appear to be covering for a missing child, um, that their conduct could be used against them to prevent them per from presenting a defense or evidence at a subsequent review hearing. Um, obviously, we need to be advising our clients to participate in the 730 evals if they're ordered for purposes of FR bypass. Um, and then, as we learned from the review hearing case, uh, if someone's asking to apply disentitlement to your client at the trial court level, we should probably be asking for that evidentiary hearing on whether or not it should and does apply to your client um, to see whether or not it can even apply. Um, so just kind of to sum everything up, what, what is required for disentitlement to apply? Number one, you need notice. Number two, an opportunity for the client to be heard. Number three, a willful act in defiance of a court order. So there has to be some sort of willful act violation of court order. And then either egregious conduct that frustrates the purpose of dependency court, which you guys, is, as we all know, the protection of the child, not the protection of our client's due process rights, um, or conduct that frustrates the ability of a party to obtain information um, that it needs. So that's what's required for disentitlement to apply. I've done a lot of talking. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Awesome. We're done.